Testing the mic. Can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me at the back? No? Can you hear me at the back? It's, oh, okay, sorry. I might have to hold the mic then. Okay, just... During the course of the lecture, if you cannot hear me, just please raise your hand and let me know. All right, um, so nice to see you all. Good morning. Um, my name is Dr. Eric Hahn. Today we'll be going through this lecture on action potentials and action potential propagation. So let's start with this um, issue that we have in our body. So we have this task of relaying neural signals from one body to the other parts of the body. Um, then there are, there are several mechanisms that we could utilize to achieve the purpose, but we've got to remember with neural signals, it's got to be quick and it's got to be able to cover a long distance. So here we've got several options. Uh, first is diffusion. You may have already heard from the membrane transport lecture given by uh, Dr. Shirley Brown. Um, you'd have seen that it's very efficient over a short distance, but it actually doesn't 
it would take very long time to get to a long distance. So for example, to travel one micrometer, it would take 0 0.2 milliseconds, but to travel a meter per sec, for, say from finger to brain, it could take up to eight years. We could consider using molecular motors, which is used to uh, convey proteins in the axon. This also proves to be quite slow, and it will take about three days, and it's not very useful for our neural signal. The other quicker mechanism that we could potentially use is circulation, but one of the issues with circulation is that it's not very specific. It's quite generalized function. So it carries nutrients around your body. Uh, yes, with usage of hormones, you can sometimes have a specific task, but it also takes quite a long time, and it will take about hundreds of seconds. So that leaves us with this one last option of using electrical potential, such as used in the retina, but this also has an issue of not being able to go far in the distance. It will dissipate away. And we will actually talk about this issue in the next few slides. So that's what brings us to this topic of action potential, which is all or none phenomenon. And this is very quick. It's an electrical signal, so it travels like the um, speed of light. And it actually is able to cover a long distance. So we shall talk about action potential and its propagation today. Uh, during the course of the lecture, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. So let's just start with a very simple anatomy of the nerve. This is what a typical peripheral nervous system, uh, nerve of yours would look like. So we, today we're going to only just talk about two types of basic nerves, axons, sorry, namely one myelinated axon and unmyelinated axon and myelinated axon. Unmyelinated is a more of a basic form that is bare itself, whereas myelinated axon has unmyelinated axon plus myelin sheets wrapped around at regular intervals. A group of axons together is called fascicle and it's covered by, it's protected by perineurium, which is filled with endoneurium for cushioning and supplying nutrition to the axon. And collectively, fascicles are gathered together under and protected under this connective tissue called epimerium. So now a little bit more about the um, action potential itself. This is what a typical action potential response would look like. Here we have an artificial stimulus that we could inject into an axon. At a very low level of stimulus, we don't get any spontaneous response, but just the response is purely due to the stimulus that we put in. So you will see that the shape of the response in the axon is somewhat very similar to what you put in. And same with about the blue level of the stimulus. But the story changes once we start to input uh, a larger current, which will get it over the threshold. And once the stimulus is strong enough and gets it over the threshold, the action potential will be generated just spontaneously by itself. And that's key where we see over the threshold it just shoots up and comes down. And once you've gone past the threshold, um, the size of the current then doesn't really matter because action potential is a all or non phenomenon. So as long as you get it over the threshold, it will always reach the same peak. So here we see a red size stimulus, which is quite, which is the maximal stimulus here, um, and it doesn't actually increase the size of the response here, but it stays the same. Just a little more about some variations of action potential that you can have. Um, first of all, the one we just looked at is what we would typically find in our peripheral nervous system, this narrow shaped one with green dotted lines. Whereas we can also have a bit of a fatter one in the heart due to the calcium input and NMDA. And that's what makes this repolarizing phase a little wider. So this upshoot is called depolarizing phase where the membrane of the axon is um, going towards zero. And repolarizing phase is where the membrane potential is actually coming down back to normal, so it's getting more polarized. 
And once the um, level of membrane potential has gone past its initial value compared to the resting potential, that phase is called hyperpolarization phase or after hyperpolarization. So today what we're going to do is just think about starting with a very basic structure of rectum and we're going to start to put some components onto it. I don't know if you remember 10, 15, 20 years ago when you're playing with your Barbie doll, you know, you started with naked, you're putting undies and bras on and then putting the dress on last. That's what we're going to do with the Exxon today, okay? So we start with bear, we're going to put some components on it and as you realize the function of each component, you'll be able to appreciate what will therefore happen to the exon and human body once those functions are taken away. And that's, that's at the very end, when we actually talk about the disease. So, have we um, looked into the sodium and potassium channel before? Or is it something that's very foreign to you? You've, if you've heard, just raise your hand so I know where you are. Okay, thank you. So this is how an action potential would be generated. Um, two main players of generating action potential are sodium channels and potassium channels. So here we have voltage-gated sodium channel, which would act to open, which is normally closed but capable of opening, would be activated and opened once there's a change in membrane potential. And it would open and it would drive, therefore, sodium ions, positive ions, to flow into the membrane of the axon. Does anyone know what drives that inflow of axon, uh, sodium ions? Concentration. concentration gradient, thank you. Um, so yes, we have uh, lower concentration gradient of sodium inside and higher concentration of sodium outside, but on top of that, we've got overall negative charge inside the axon compared to the outside. So the negative charge is attracting sodium ions to come in to this axon. And once um, the sodium equilibrium potential have reached, it's also about the time where the sodium gate will inactivate and it will close so that inflow of sodium will stop and at this state, um, the sodium channel is not able to be open, activated again. And that's what we refer to as refractory period, which we will not cover too much today. But that is a very important mechanism, otherwise um, you will go through com uh, spontaneous combustion because you will not be able to stop your neural signal. And then you've got your voltage-gated potassium channel, which just works in the right timing so that it opens as sodium channels uh, closing. That's because your potassium channels are slow in action. So it's a bit of a wonder that it actually works in a perfect timing because if it was to open any earlier, um, then it would cancel the depolarization. So when the potassium channel opens, then you've got uh, potassium ions will start to flow out, which brings, because you're using positive charge from your inside of an axon, your membrane potential, which is measured of the inside of an axon, come down. Once again here, we've got high concentration of potassium ions inside the axon and low potassium concentration outside. Um, and we had local char positive charge building up due to the sodium. That's what pushes potassium ions out. So that's what basically makes up this shape of an axon potential. So here I've just made a, just a very brief and basic animation for you to appreciate how this might work. So we've got sodium channels opening, which causes the sodium ions to flow in, and that will bring our membrane potential up. Once we've reached the peak and the sodium channel is closed, we'll reach the peak. And then our potassium channel will open, just about the right time, and that will cause our potassium ions to flow out, and that will bring our membrane potential back down. Now, because the potassium uh, uh, channel doesn't close at this time, 
it actually closes slower as well. That's what causes hyperpolarization. And once the potassium channel has closed, then you've got the action of sodium potassium AP ATPA, the pump, that brings the membrane potential back to the normal. But you don't have to really worry about that at the now. So here to just give you a different perspective of the action potential. Um, during the rest, the permeability of potassium is slightly bigger than sodium because most of the sodium channels are closed, but at rest we've got um, leakage potassium channels which are open, remains open, and um, that's what causes permeability of potassium to be slightly higher. But more importantly, once we go into the depolarization phase, as sodium channels open, obviously that causes permeability of sodium to be greater than potassium. That's phase two. And as we have now sodium channels inactivated and potassium channels open, then we will have greater permeability of potassium ion. And the duration of the action potential can last from about one to two milliseconds. Where, um, but if you actually consider action potential in the heart, it can last up to about two to four hundred milliseconds. So we've just now talked about how potassium, uh, sodium and potassium channels can contribute to generation of an actual potential at one site. And obviously that's not going to be enough for us because we need to convey this signal from one part of the body, say from finger, to the brain. So now we're going to talk about how it actually propagates. And in this process of propagation, we are faced with two limitations. So what happens um, with initial discharge, depolarization is that the positive sodium channel, uh, ions goes into the um, axon and they will travel along the axon. So in them moving away from the initial position, initial discharging site, they are faced with this internal resistance. So imagine like this, if you've got a your um, garden hose, if you turn the tap on and your garden hose is very narrow, it's going, there's going to be a lot more resistance than if you had a very large hose. So having a small hose causes bigger resistance, that's what causes internal resistance. Having a bigger hose causes less resistance and that allows an easier flow of water through the hose. So that's how you can actually understand a bit of um, this internal resistance. So in fact, the diameter of axon does contribute to the um, RI. So bigger the diameter, lower the RI. Smaller the diameter, higher the RI. And uh, to favor the propagation of the charge, we want the RI to be lower. And that makes sense. The other um, limitations that we are faced with, that we have to solve, is the body has to solve is the leak across the membrane, which is called um, the membrane resistance, RM. And RM is a bit like having a hose, but having a many holes on the hose. And you can imagine when you turn the tap on, all the waters will leak out. And if there are enough holes, all the waters will leak out until it gets to the end. Does that make sense? So if you've got all, uh, too much of leakage of iron before it reaches the next phase, next segment, you will lose all the charge. So the signals won't propagate. So that's one limitation that we also have to work with. So this just, um, you don't really have to worry about this electrical diagram, but this is just showing as a symbol existence of RM across the membrane and RI, internal resistance along the axon. So what, when we actually inject a positive current into the axon, this is what actually happens. It will, once it goes into the axon, will be uh, propelled on either side of the axon and pushed down. And as it gets further away from the side of the injection, obviously the size of the charge will dissipate and get lost and get smaller. How is it lost? It's just like we talked about with RM. Um, it will just leak out. 
and as it gets further away, the size of the potential will get smaller and smaller. And if you were to plot that um, potential, this, this is what it would look like. So it would just slowly disappear away as we get, as we get away from the site of discharge. So here's the limitation. So we want this signal, action potential that's been generated, to be carried along the axon. We, we don't want it to be lost. But here, that's what would happen if we didn't have anything else intervening into this process. It would just be naturally lost. So in order for a successful action potential to occur and propagate, we need um, active current that leads rege regenerating spread of depolarization. So what would typically happen in your axons are that these positive charges move along, but before it dissipates away, all the charges dissipate away, hopefully it will be enough to trigger the next action potential in the next segment. So the same process is repeating. So changing of that um, local depolar, uh, changing of ch uh, membrane potential in the next segment will trigger another opening of sodium channels and potassium channels, and hopefully that will cause another action potential to be generated. And that's what causes action potential to be propagated along the axon. So opening of sodium channel is therefore very important in the neighboring segment. This is just to demonstrate um, this phenomena. So if we were to inject hyperpolarizing current, which is actually bringing your membrane potential lower, away from zero, which is not depolarizing and doesn't activate sodium channels, what will happen is if you were to measure the internal potential of the axon at this different site, Due to the hyperpolarizing current, you'd see that the size of this uh, response just die away, decay away, just like the one, the curve that you saw in the previous slide. Whereas if you inject depolarizing current, which is efficient, uh, which is the right stimulus for opening sodium current, sodium channel, it will trigger action potential, and this action potential will cause inflow of sodium ions, which then is able to travel down and trigger opening of sodium channels at different sites and cause another action potential and so on. And that's what we call regenerative propagation by active current. And this is what causes it to be all or none. Okay, at this moment I will throw a question at you um, just to see if you know. Um, if we inject a current here, obviously the picture should just show you that the current does um, travel in both ways. Does that normally happen in our body? No? Why not? Okay, here. Yeah. Maybe you're slightly on a different topic. That's okay. But you're right. Um, so it wouldn't, it's not very physiological because, yeah, it, it's unidirectional. And the reason it doesn't actually trigger action potential to travel backwards is because of the refractory period that we talked about. So it, once the action potential is starting to be generated, um, it will only propagate forward, but not backwards, because this, the segment that it has just gone past is all the inactivated sodium channels still there, so they are not able to be activated. So that's what prevents action potential from traveling backwards, but it actually can happen in our body, for example, at funny bones. If you bump your elbow into a corner, that will trigger an action potential in the middle of an axon that will actually generate a bilateral action potential. So let's just talk a little bit more about um, 
So we've just talked about how the propagation of the action potential works. So let's now just talk about more specifically about what then governs the speed of the action potential. So this is depend upon lambda over the uh, tau, which is the space constant over the time constant. We'll just talk a bit more about the lambda and tau in the next few slides. But what I want you to get out of this slide is the fact that it just depends on myelination. So myelination makes it quicker. And then we have axon diameter. We talked about how axon diameter can actually reduce RI. So allows it to allows a positive charge to travel down the axon more efficiently. That actually helps with the velocity of the conduction. So that's greater the diameter, favors the conduction velocity. And thirdly, temperature. This is a bit of a tricky one. We might get to talk about it at the very last slide. But you think at a high temperature, uh, this oh, we'll talk about this later. But yes, with a t high temperature, it does travel faster, but then it does decrease the chance of action potential being generated, as well, especially in a diseased patients like MS. So let's talk about the space constant. Um, this, we, I don't know if you noticed, it was here, this, this distance. It's a distance that it takes for the signal to decay to 37% of the original amplitude, and it is equal to the square root of Rm, the membrane resistance over Ri, which is also proportional to the square root of diameter. So once again, with the equation, you can see um, greater than Rm, which is the uh, resistance across the membrane. Therefore, there will be if Rm is higher, it means there will be less leakage, meaning less holes in the hose. Means um, you can increase the velocity of the conduction because it will make the travel of the charge more efficient without leaking. With Ri, we've talked about it. So greater the Ri, quicker the feed dissipates and gets lost. So if, if you think about it, if there's a traffic jam of ions in, inside the um, axon, there's greater chance that the ions can just leak out and be, the charge be lost. And that will decrease. So when this increases, lambda will decrease. And when lambda decreases, the velocity will decrease. You don't have to get too bogged down about the mass itself. Just understand the principle. And here we have the time constant. Um, with the time constant, we are more talking about the capacitance that we've just talked about, um, Rm. Um, so here we've got voltage, current, and resistance. And capacitance, capacitance is basically a um, phenomenon where you can observe. When you turn your laptop off, for, for example, You've got the green light that just dissipates away, not instantly, but will take time to go away. So this is the phenomenon of capacitance. So basically, with higher capacitance, your axon takes time to get charged, and it will also take time to discharge. And that's not very favorable for a conduction. It will slow things down. So it's basically higher the capacitance, um, slower the conduction can be. So we want for cut fast conduction tau to be lower. Lower the tau, tau, greater the conduction velocity. So we've just briefly touched on the um, importance of myelin. So let's now, we have, we, with the, when we started with bare axon, we've added sodium and potassium channels. We've talked about how it propagates with by adding other sodium and potassium channels on different segments. So let's now add my myelin to it and see. We've just talked about how myelin, um, well, RM and RI, how the speed of conduction can increase. And basically, what myelin can do is increase RM by wrapping. So if you've got lots of hole in your hose, if you put it on your gaffer tape and block all the hoses off, that's like having the effect of myelin. So myelin is a great insulator. It will block off all the leak, leaking holes. 
and that will increase the efficiency of the conduction, so increase the velocity. So that's one way you can think about it, and we'll also talk about another way why speed of the conduction increases with myelination. One thing to note with myelination is in your peripheral nervous system, it's originated a drive from Schwann cells, and in your central nervous system, same function, but it's derived from oligodendrocytes. Basically it means in the disease, if a certain virus or disease targets these particular cells, um, that's why you see PNS specific disease or CNS specific disease. Um, and this is how vastly the speed of conduction can differ between myelinated axons and unmyelinated axons. Here we have uh, A beta and I gamma fibers, which are large and myelinated, small but myelinated, but they were myelinated, and you can see that they're fairly quick compared to your unmyelinated fibers, which are about 100 times slower. And I thought I would just demonstrate what this is like um, in the room. We can play like a just very short um, Chinese whisper. Um, I'm just trying to pick a row that can represent an axon. So, okay. So I'll get our um, one, two, three, four. The fifth row to be myelinated axon, and our last row to be unmyelinated axon. So what I'll do is I'll whisper a phrase to the person on one end, and with myelinated people, you've got to jump from. You can only you can you can actually yell out the uh, message. So it's not really whisper. So. <laughs> And the fifth person, or the third or fourth, can hear it and pass on the message. And let's see how they compare with unmodern axon, where they actually have to actually whisper to the person next to one another. And you're not allowed to yell. Does that make sense? I mean, we probably won't do it now, but if... Oh, okay, you want to do it. All right. Alright, so when I say start, let's have a race between unmyelinated axon and myelinated axon. So what's your name? Myelinated axon? Jamie. So Jamie's row is myelinated axon. And what's your name? Yep. No, you. Yeah. Matt. Matt is the last, the ending of myelinated axon. And the person behind you? Shed. And shed is the end of unmyelinated axon. So when you hear the message, when the message gets to you, can you just yell out so the whole class can hear it? Okay. So let's just keep quiet. And three, two, one, go. Come on, Mylon, the next one. Mylon, the next one, come on. Raise the signal. Yell to the person. That's it. Come on, Nadine. Yes. Yes, solitary conduction. 
Hold on. On Martin Lexon, where's the signal? Oh, he's still going. Is efficient. Thank you. So solitary conduction is efficient. You just saw that. We did have a bit of demyelination in this segment, which slowed the conduction down. We'll talk about that a bit later, towards the end. And that, that was good. That actually uh, something I didn't expect. But that was a perfect example of demyelination, where your conduction is hindered. But you could see that how with solitary conduction is where the phenomena we describe when the action potential jumps from node to node. So here we started with James and you could jump and you could actually propagate quite fast. With, whereas with on myelin axon, it has to be communicated to all the sorting channels available. Okay? And that's what slows it down. So once again here it's... Um, let me just put the mic back on. We've actually talked much about this um, already, but just with now addition of myelin in it, we've got um, myelin that increases membrane resistance, so by wrapping it around, blocks off all the holes, so causes now all the positive charges to efficiently flow downwards. But obviously myelin doesn't, uh, doesn't affect RI, because RI is mainly influenced by the diameter of the axon. Sorry. So you'll see, um, therefore, space constant and velocity are increased. So that's what it's... So what we just saw, the solitary conduction that we'll just talk about a bit more now, is where the positive charge inflows and then travels down efficiently because of this wrapping, and it will cause triggering of another set of sodium channels to open at the next node. And sometimes it doesn't have to be the next node, but sometimes it can actually depolarize several nodes at the same time. And that's what causes this conduction to jump from node to node. And that greatly increases the speed of conduction in myelinated axons. So I hope you're now starting to appreciate how all the components of axons that we have serves a very specific purpose. And without them, you know, we're going to be hindered. So here is, um, now let me put in a bigger picture. So we've now looked at single axons. We've now finally added myelins onto them. So now let's look at what happens if we put all the myelins together, uh, axons together. So that's what would represent your typical nerve, like a fascicle, number of axons together. This is, what, this is similar to what you're going to do in your prac on Thursday, on Friday. I'll see you on Thursday. Um, you will be stimulating median nerve from first digits of the finger. So this is the side of stimulation. And once you insert a certain amount of stimulus, if it's below threshold, you will not generate any axons. But once you put some stimulus that's large enough to get it over the threshold, you see, well, you won't see solitary conduction happening in your subject's arm, but you will measure a compound, what's called compound action potential. So the difference between action potential and compound action potential is the compound is, you know, all the axons summed up together. So obviously, with a single action potential, the peak doesn't change. With compound action potential, the size can actually change because the more actions are added, the bigger the potential gets. So if we increase the size of the stimulus, that will recruit more axons and that will cause the compound action potential to grow bigger. And we can actually reach the super maximal stimulus, which will initiate action potential from all of the axons and we we'll get what's called super maximal response. Maximal response. With compound action potential, um, 
measuring compound action potential, what you can also expect to see is um, different peaks because of different axons traveling, uh, having a different conduction velocity. So the fastest alpha fibers will reach first, and that's what we will typically be measuring of in the lab. We probably won't see beta fibers, which will form a smaller peak a little later. And definitely we won't see gamma fibers because they are the unmyelinated ones, unmyelinated ones, and they, uh, they won't be initiated with the stimulus size that we use. It's a pain fiber, pain fiber, and we need to have a very strong stimulus to be able to initiate them. And it also occurs, it's very, because it's very slow, you will not be able to see this response in the window that you have, um, unless you increase the window by hundredfold. Okay, so what allows um, saltatory conduction to occur is <coughs> that at the node, node of Rambier, we have a very high density of sodium channels. And you find that under the Marlin sheet, there aren't that many sodium channels compared to how much you have in the nodes. So you can see how with even small amount or smaller amount than, um, than normal can actually trigger action potential if you have myelin because you've got a high number of channels available at the node. So the more channels open, the faster the ions will flow in and quickly discharge the membrane and get it over the threshold and that's what allows um, this conduction to be very fast and actually operate with smaller number of ions, so it makes it, uh, makes it very efficient, which will then you know, allow less number of ion needs to be transported back in for resting membrane potential, um, so saving energy as well. So now, if we do lose myelin, this is what we can expect. So this is normal conduction, <coughs> which we've just talked about along all the lecture now. So if you have an action potential um, being generated at one node, you will see the same size action potential and same frequency of action potential at every node of Rambier. That's what you would expect in a normal, healthy axon. But if you have demyelination in a segment, like we had in today's class, that's what we experience, decreased conduction velocity. Um, because the ions, because we've lost um, myelin, saltatory conduction is lost. See, in this segment, it's like having that unmyelinated segment conduction happening here. So that's what slows it. And also, sometimes it can fail because um, too much iron is being lost. And that's why we have frequency-related block. So although you may have had put in four stimuli, you may only end up getting three or two responses. And total conduction block is a bit more severe case of this, where none is being conducted through, but all are being lost. And in also a very severe case, you can have an ectopic impulse generation where there's no stimulus, but just your axons firing randomly. They can be very uncomfortable. Um, and increased mechanosensitivity, which means um, you know, you, if someone touches you or you bump into an object, they can actually initiate action potential easier than normal. Um, diagram C also shows another possibility of the potential impulse jumping from one axon to another, and it's called crosstalk. Okay, so these are some of the demyelinating diseases that you can come across. I don't know if you do get a lecture on demyelination disease, but here I just briefly introduce them to you. So 
we have NS, multiple sclerosis, which is very prominent um, demyelinating disease in Australia and in the world. It affects your central nervous system mainly, and it's an autoimmune disease um, against myelin, oligodendrocytes, and it affects different segments of your nervous system. So sometimes it can affect your retina, uh, the optic nerve, in which case the person can experience blindness and pain in the eye. Um, the, person can, the patient can also have double vision if MS is attacking um, brainstem, the pon area, where it's responsible for governing the coordination of the eye movement. Um, to my understanding today, it's, although it's not curable with modern drugs and therapies, treatments, it is able to be managed and um, treated as a patient's prognosis can be quite long. Uh, with diabetic neuropathy, patients, uh, due to the treatments that they go through and also the nerve that deteriorates, uh, they can experience demyelination. And this is specific to peripheral nervous system, and in which they can actually experience numbness in the fingers or hands or feet. Um, sometimes, you know, they cut themselves but do not realize they have done so and get the infection and have to end up cutting their limbs and toes and so on. guillain barre syndrome is also another autoimmune disease that attacks peripheral nervous system. Um, this causes temporary inflammation of the nervous system in different parts. Not everybody has different manifestation of the symptoms, but in some cases, the lungs can also be affected. Um, so in one sense, you'll find a patient awake and conscious but not able to breathe for about a week or two, um, during which time you actually have to put the patient on ventilation so they can just rely on the ventilation and survive. And once they experience healing of the myelins again, um, they can gain the function of the lung again. So the good thing about peripheral nervous system disease is that because it remyelinates, there's a better chance of getting better. Whereas in the central nervous system, it's quite hard. Um, Charcot-Marie tooth is a, more of a genetic one. Um, and we won't talk too much about that one, but that, that affects the chromosome that is responsible for forming the myelin sheets. So that's what causes the um, degeneration, obviously. And lastly, um, this is how the temperature can affect action potential propagation especially in disease. So if we say this is a normal myelinated nerve, action potential, if you decrease the temperature, what you will typically see is the duration of the action potential get wider. And that's because the temperature affects the kinetics of your uh, sodium and potassium channel. So although you might think lowering of temperature co would cause inefficient conduction. In some cases like MS, where there's demyelination, um, if you slow the opening and closing of sodium channel, it gives greater chance for ions to move in and out. So sodium channels will close slower, so it will give more time for it to be polarized, uh, depolarized, and that will increase the chance of the next sodium channels to open, and because sodium potass uh, potassium channels are also closing slower, that delays the phase of repolarization to later. Okay, so that's all I want to say. So today, um, I hope you can appreciate, because all these different components of your axon plays this specific role to make action potential work. Um, hope you can you're able to appreciate how different parts are so important, specifically designed, so that it can work. And as a last note of thought, why don't we then therefore think about if all our body parts are so specifically designed and made for such specific purpose, then what might be your purpose? Thank you.
Could I just have the person who took the slide off me come up? Just who was the person who took the slides off me? Apparently, you guys all had the problem of getting the lecture slides. Is that right? The blackboard was down. No idea. I didn't
Because that would mean the conduction velocity would increase the key increase the, I mean, the increase of the, um, the membrane resistance. But that doesn't seem to like make any sense. So what I can see is this RM mm. is actually going to be on the top, not the bottom. So should that be proportional to so should tau be equal to CM over RM? No, 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 because here, so it's RM over RI, yeah. and proportionality is lambda over tau, and tau is RM, mm. so Yeah, sure. But is it does it is it supposed to increase with an increased um, RM or a decrease? In no, it will increase. It will, the conduction velocity will increase if your RM is increased because it prevents the leakage. Yes, right. yeah. it's like blocking off the hole. Okay. Yeah. So here RM is that's what you mean. So RM is increased here. Then you're saying. Because if the proportion, if they're both proportional, but it's one <laughs> proportional to the, yeah. to the actual RM or one is proportional mm. to the square root. Good point. So you're saying that will increase with more RM. than the other one, and so the conduction velocity in total mm. should decrease with the other one. That's a good point. Okay. Let me have a look at that one just further. I haven't actually thought about that one. Okay. Oh, good question. Well done. How would we get the answer for that? Oh, I don't think you'll have to worry about this. Oh, okay. So it does look that. But right. as long as you know that um, decrease in RM, so increase in RM, so therefore, so the uh, membr uh, membrane resistance, if it's increased, yeah. so there's less like, leakage that increases the pressure. Ah, that's something else. So that's what you need to know. And in RI, if it's reduced, um, then there's more efficient flow of the, um, the positive charge, so therefore the conduction will be Yeah. So there are the two things. In yeah. But in terms of mathematics, proof? Yeah. We haven't really get into that. That's okay. good. With the um, with the myelination as well. So if you've got, you said that like there's no um, potassium channels underneath the myelin sheet, and so it jumps from from the nodes. No, no, there's not none. But I said like not as much. Not as much. Oh, uh, is that not as much in comparison to the nodes, or not as much in comparison to an unmyelinated? Compared to the nodes. But even if there were that many, mm. um, because the myelin is so efficient in insulating, even if those channels open, it probably wouldn't have much effect. Because it still propagate to the point where it can still reach the threshold for the next node anyway. Yeah. To reach the next Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Although we haven't, I haven't seen an experiment that's done that. Before. Oh, in theory, I'll think that. Right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one small, sure. very quick. Uh, uh, does the myelination will actually change our eyes? Hmm? <laughs>